All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome into the third episode of the Big Hoops Watchdog Podcast. I am one of your hosts. I'm Graham Dynas. And I'm Taylor Seymour. All right. Before we get started, just a, a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, make sure you, that you uh, drop a like on this video. Give us a subscribe. Any sort of help is is greatly appreciated by us. We're we're looking to grow, and you know we're we're small now, but we're going to be mighty eventually. So you you know how how all that works. Um, any subscribers would be would be very helpful. Uh, as well, we have a Twitter account at b one g watchdog news. Uh, the link to that will be in the description of this video. Please give us a follow there. Um, and a TikTok account as well, same handle, link for that will also be down in the description, and we'll start posting our, our clips, our best moments on TikTok here shortly. Um, so yeah, give us a follow on those, on those places, give us a subscribe and like the video, um, and I guess that's it, let's get, let's get into it. Our first story of the game, uh, of the day, we're, we're recording this on on a Thursday night, right after a couple of the games, it's 8.45 p.m. Central, 9.45 Eastern for Taylor. Um, and so let's give a breakdown on the uh, the Michigan Northwestern game that, that you just watched, Taylor. What would you say? Uh, I only got to watch the last one minute of the first half and, and then the entire second half. Uh, but my goodness, did a team decide to show up today, and that team was a team that has not shown up all year the Michigan Wolverines. They had, I think at one point, 18 of 18 were shots made on assists, which is one, an insane stat in itself, and two for this team because they have had problems with turnovers. They've had problems with sharing the rock. They've had all sorts of problems. Additionally, they were 13 of 16 from the free throw line and shot over 40% from the field, 35% from three. Um, if the team can do that with any sort of semblance to consistency, then maybe they'll have a shot at making the tournament and a game or two. Um, Northwestern looked like they were fatigued. They were dead. I think they said they played five games in 10 days or something on the broadcast, something like yeah, that. Yeah. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be more. I feel like it's like eight and 19 or something. It's, it's a yeah. crazy number because of that COVID pause. They looked they look tired. Not, the offense stuck. They just dribbled the ball a lot in one spot. Um, gave a lot of turnovers. Had some runouts that they didn't get back on. Um, they're starting to show that they've played a lot of games in a lot of days. Um, but I still don't think they're a bad team. They're uh, tied for fourth place with six other teams in the Big Ten at six and five. Um, so they they they're in great position to go get a double buy, even especially a single buy, and. Uh, I don't think I don't think this is going to be a, a trend that they're going to set. I think once they get through all these this slog of two weeks of games, then they'll be back at it. We've talked about in the past couple of episodes how you live and you die with Chase Audish, and you he do. shot he shot four of sixteen today, zero of seven from three. They score fifty one points and lose by seventeen at home. That has to play some factor, obviously. Yeah, that's that's a very well known thing at this point. I think I think it's going to be on every scouting report that gets put into a locker room before a game against Northwestern. If you stop Chase Adige, they really don't have a chance at winning. Um, and tonight he he proved that fact because they got rather easily handled, and he had he would you say four for seventeen or something like that? Four of sixteen. Four of sixteen, yeah, and no from oh for seven for three, so. If he's That's not a, cooking with with Bowie at the same time, they kind of struggle. But yeah, Bowie played great. He had twenty three. He, he shot nine of nineteen. Again, those two guys shooting thirty five shots is absolutely nothing to that team. That's that's just what they. Do. That's what they need to do, and then they, they just need those shots to fall. Julian Rover they was back. He scored twenty two, or no, he played twenty two minutes. He scored four. Um, yeah, this team six and five. I think they're. They're with everyone being at six and five. Their team, especially with how this stretch is going to finish up for them, playing so many games in so many days, and then you follow that up with um, the other teams that they're tied with. I I see them being a single by team, not a double by team. Um, that being said, they're going to be a team that if they if they get their win on Thursday, they're going to challenge a team in the the quarters on Friday, and 
this team is definitely a team that has a chance to be playing in this, at least the semis of the Big Ten tournament. And they're a team that's going to make the NCAA tournament, whether that's somewhere from probably the, the 9 to 11 range. And that's a team I don't want to play, a team that sits down in guards and has guys that can win a game by themselves. That's that's a tough matchup. Yeah, and if 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 Adish decides he wants to put three games together, they're they're in the Sweet 16 Elite Eight. I mean, you're looking at it. So or your thoughts on uh the Joey Baker performance. Joey Baker, uh he decided, yeah, he, he made a couple threes there in the second half that I saw. He also had um a steal or two um there. He uh came off the bench to do that too, which is something he's been doing more often. He started one game when Jet was hurt, but uh, I like his role off the bench, especially if he's going to bring 14 to the to the game, every game off the bench. But, um, yeah, I think this is something more of what he looked like at Duke and when he was coming into Michigan. Uh, if he can keep this up, it's it bodes well for the rest of the team because, I mean, you feed off everybody, and Joey's uh, one of those guys, especially if you come off the bench, then uh, the guys really get behind you. Yeah, if you uh... – if, you, if, if the scales are balanced in a, in a Northwestern Michigan game, Chase Audige going 4-16 and Joey Baker coming in with three threes and 14 points off the bench, that, that weights scale pretty heavily. It, it's harder to lose whenever you're getting that performance from your guy and that performance from the other team's best guy. Yeah, and if, if he wasn't in foul trouble, he would have played more and probably would have got more. I mean, he was hot and he just had foul trouble. So the game could have been worse than 17. I was, uh, I was kind of thinking that we were going to get a rant based on what we saw this weekend out of this Michigan team from you. you. You know, there was a rant formulating in my head. It was very frustrating. But then they come out and get a quad one win, and I, I, I'm I, back Always on the – Always forgiven. I'm Always back on the, on the wagon. Nothing – It's – this team, is it's unpredictable. You can say that about the entire league, but you go in and you, you go into – Penn State and you lose by 22 on a Sunday and then on Thursday you lose or you win by 17 on the road at, in Evanston. Um, this team is is good enough to win in this league. I thought they were probably a top three team heading into the season. Um, they, they haven't met those expectations, but that team played tonight. So, like yeah, I said, if they, if they had that team when they played Virginia, when they played Penn State, when they played Kentucky, when they played Purdue, I mean – they're winning all those games, and then they're uh, they're sitting at a six line in the tournament, and you're, you know, instead of on the outside looking in, very heavily on the outside. So, for the next month, if this team can show up, I think they'll they'll be in, and they might get, you know, they might have to play an eight nine and then a one, but they'll be in. All right, and then the other game that just wrapped up here. Um... Wisconsin gets a five point road win over the the tumbling Ohio State Buckeyes. Um, Wisconsin went up big to finish the first half. They were up 43 27. Chris Holtman got tossed right before the half. Did you um, see what happened there? I, what do you say? I know he's yelling at John Higgins. I didn't, I don't know if he must have just said the magic word because he didn't really look out of the ordinary for normal coaches. Maybe he was, I couldn't see where he was at on the sideline. Maybe he was pretty far down at the yeah. center of the of the scores table but it looked rather calm especially for other compared to other coaches in the Big 10 if you look at yeah. McCaffrey and Underwood and Jawan and Izzo I mean yeah yes yeah. he looked rather put together and he got double teched immediately I don't know so he must have said the wrong thing it had to have been what he said um and yeah so Sejan goes to the line he hits four free throws um in a row, they get the ball back and they score. Chucky Hepburn two to finish the half at six points. Little little step they, back. They, they lose by five. Um, but they came out in the second half with a with a renewed sense of purpose. They won the second half by eleven. Bryce Sensabaugh fouled out with nine twenty left in the game. He was still the leading scorer, and they made the comeback without him. I don't know what to make of that. I mean, I thought he was the one leading the charge for in all these games. He was the guy leading in scoring, at least. And it looked like to be playing relatively good defense and off-the-ball offense. But, yeah, without him, and then they made that comeback. I don't know if he's holding the team back he's, and he's, he's the one ho hogging the ball and that's their problem, or if there's something else going on and they just 
did it without him today. I don't know. He has the talent, obviously, to be the best player on this team. He is the best player on this team. But since he's, like, taken over as the true number one guy, that's when they've started to lose these games. So it's it's weird. It's hard to describe. He only played 16 minutes tonight. But here, do we, do we have a number on his plus minus? We do not. That's unfortunate. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he fouled out with 10 minutes left in the game. Uh, Jake Diebler took over as the the interim coach as Holtman came back to the locker room. And, took an early shower. Yeah. And so since the ball was playing with four fouls with 10 minutes left and he fouls out, but yeah, they, they started to make a comeback. Wisconsin was able to hold him off. This Wisconsin team, you know, Tyler Wall went two for 10 tonight and had five points. And they still were able to pull out a five point road win in in Columbus, 17 from Asijan, 15 from Hepburn, 14 from Crowell, 12 from Klesmet. Just a balanced effort. That's what this team can do. Yeah, but I don't I don't know that this that this would have held for a team that's not bottom of the conference. I mean, Ohio State's been pretty rough for the past three weeks. Um, if they were playing, I mean – Iowa at that rate, I think I think Iowa probably beats them. If they're playing Penn State at that rate, I think Penn State probably beats them. I mean, that's just me, but I think they 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 had a a lucky night to to not have Wall go off and to have some even distribution. That being said, I mean any road win in the conference is a good road. Oh, win. you take and that this, any day of the week. It's impossible. And, yeah, this Ohio State team is a they're a competent bottom half of the Big Ten team though, even though they are in this skid. Um, this is, I mean, this is a good win for a Wisconsin team. Ohio State is still 29th in net. So, for now, this is still a quad one win. And I think it, it probably still will be because it, it's a road win either way. So, this Wisconsin team, I think they were probably, you know, floating around the edge of the bubble and not on the bubble, as in, like, the outside of the bubble. Um, but they're firmly back on it now with this win. Um, and who do they play this weekend? They play North. They have a rematch against Northwestern. They played literally like a week and a half ago. <laughs> That's because of that gonna, COVID pause. Yeah, they're going to play again. I believe on Sunday. Yeah, it's Sunday at five thirty Central. And is are they at home? Uh, yes, yeah, at Wisconsin. Yeah. So. So I mean that there's another chance to extend your tournament resume, get back to five hundred in league play, and you know get this team right back on track. Interesting things ahead for this. Wisconsin team. They're well coached. Greg Gard is one of the best coaches in the league. I'm not overly concerned with him. The issue is, you know, will the talent be able to come through in some of these games down the stretch? Yeah, and I then, don't think it's a coaching problem. It's it's a talent question. I don't think they have they're missing a piece or two that they would normally have. But, like Johnny Davis. Yes, precisely. So yeah, that's uh that's all we've got for these games tonight. Um we'll we'll do this more often probably, I think, if there's Saturday games and they they're in the six o'clock block and we don't have any games that are ending at 11 on the east coast we'll probably come with some uh some quick reactions to the games that just got played and then we'll post this video on on a friday um so yeah be on the lookout for more of those moving along to our main headline uh of the show here we have the the feud that's been going on the past two days um, with the Illini Orange Crush student section and uh, the Iowa Athletic Department. Okay, I'm going to let you speak on this before I give my thoughts and yeah. the official statement from the podcast, but you go <laughs> yeah. ahead and... Your official statement. You, no, 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 no. The our... official statement from the no, podcast. No, 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 no. no. I, it, is, it is right here. It, it is a legal binding document, the, the official statement of, of the podcast. And uh, But please explain to the world... Okay. The uh, the atrocities that occurred in Champaign this past week. The atrocities, war crimes, possibly. There, we won't. No, we might not go that far. Absolutely not. Um, so on Wednesday, uh, the Orange Crush Twitter account made the tweet, um, fairly long tweet. They could have been more concise, but basically posting all the blame on Iowa because they back in I believe August, whenever the the schedule was announced, had bought or had reserved 200 tickets for um, for the game that's happening on Saturday in Iowa City because the student section takes a road trip every year to an opposing Big Ten game. Um, 
So they get the tickets in the mail, like the tickets, they're, they're validated, whatever. They have them. And then yesterday, February 1st, three days before game day, Iowa calls um, the, the Orange Crush and says that their tickets are invalidated and that they won't be able to come. So they, put, they make their Twitter post basically explaining all this, explaining that they lost a fifth of their, their budget on this, on, on busing even though they got a full refund for the tickets. Um, and people started throwing a lot of haymakers at Iowa, and then they just immediately responded with, Illinois was pretending to be the Boys and Girls Club of Champaign whenever they were buying these tickets. So they defrauded them, and then um, so they pulled the tickets. And the, the best thing that Iowa did in this moment was they gave the tickets that they invalidated to the Cedar Rapids Boys and Girls Club. Very nice gesture. I'm, I'm happy for those 200 kids that are going to be able to go uh, to this game. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, Illinois technically did nothing wrong. Oh, oh, oh sir, sir, sir. Here's, 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 where, sir. Here's, where, here's where I'm coming in. This is this is me personally. They Iowa holds the right to withhold tickets from whoever they want whenever you're buying these group deals. So whenever Illinois comes to buy these tickets, they can't say we're the Orange Crush. We'd like to buy 200 tickets. I was going to say no. Now in the past, because we do this every year, we go somewhere. I remember, or I was reading that in '05 they went up to Chrysler and. They got a certain number of tickets and they were asked if like, cause they were a group, they were asked if they wanted to tour the stadium and they said no because they'd get found out. So then instead they got a picture with Tommy Amaker. And so if they walk into stadiums, this is a tradition, walk into stadiums wearing the right team's colors. And then as soon as the game's about to start, rip off these shirts and they're wearing orange. So that it's, it's a, it's a team tradition. It's something that, has been happening for 20 years now. This is the 20th time they're going to do it. Um, and they finally got caught. And so uh, Mark, Tw- Mark Titus from the Titus and Tate podcast with Fox, he made a tweet that I really liked. And it was um, basically saying, whenever you run the risk of being a, a, another organization when you're buying these tickets, you're, you're running the risk of getting them pulled. And Illinois, is, we've gotten lucky the past 21 years, however many years it's been, that it hasn't happened, but it just caught up with us and we're overdue. It's kind of like, you know, the kids are trying to game the system and, you know, sometimes the system has to win, you know? So, so there's that. And I will say we did not pose as the boys and girls club. We posed as a boys and girls club. So no official title there, but obviously that's where you went wrong. A couple of years ago, they posed as a like a fake organization, and then they can't, they decided they couldn't do that anymore because they'd get found out that it wasn't a real organization. Um, and so, I think that's still probably the best bet. Just create an okay. organization that you that is neutral. Like call it the I don't know, like the Champagne, I don't know, like Men's League Basketball Group. But the something. issue is. This year, like normally they bring 50, 60 kids, something like that. It's mostly upperclassmen. This year, they, they bought 200 tickets. And so if you're going to be a fake organization, if you're going to – like something that I would have recommended would being like a, like a family reunion or like an alumni group potentially. Um, that, yeah, but, that's what I'm saying. But, you make some you have, group that is non-controversial and, and they'll accept Whenever you have 200, though, that's kind of where it's like, is this really what this group is? So that's that's kind of the issue here. And I'm sure was I, that Iowa kind of flagged that as soon as the purchase was made. I don't like that they – I'm assuming they probably knew relatively quickly that it was not the Champagne Boys and Girls Club. They knew that because we, we've done this for 20 years. And then they wait until Wednesday whenever we can't get a, our deposit back on the buses for the game. So, you know, they put us out $6,000. I, I wasn't a huge fan of that. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of, of blame to be passed around here. Uh, before I think, before... I think the, 
entirety of it rests upon the decision makers of the Orange Crush. But see, I don't I don't even know what my opinion is, is that there there isn't a ton of blame. I guess I just said there's a ton of blame. People are making it to where there's a ton of blame. This issue got blown way out of proportion. I would blame that on the Orange Crush or like their tweet. They're, people are like tagging huge college basketball people. I know Sports Illustrated put out an article about this. Yeah, they did. I saw it's, it's everywhere. And it doesn't need to be everywhere. That's kind of where I think the, you know, the polarizing aspect of it is coming from. I think there are a couple issues with the whole situation. First off, this surely has to be some sort of federal crime, okay? Wire fraud, identity theft, something is going on here. You can't just claim to be a charity paying money and have zero consequences. Here, okay, okay. The Orange Crush is a not-for-profit. They have, they are a, a charity. They raise money for charity. Like that's the issue. Like, I'm sure that the money that that we're getting refunded. Is who's going to say? Charity. Who's to say they actually donated that money? Doing did, shady they, things. They could have used already, the two thousand six hundred dollars to pay for the two hundred tickets. But they know they they paid for the tickets. Do we have the receipts? Do we have the receipts? I mean, of the I don't personally. Here's and the buy and the buying of tickets. Here's, okay, there. Uh, another thing that I saw is that uh, after we made there needs the, to be a paper trail here. After like, we made, this, because that's we made the deal. tweet. We made the tweet that was we lost six thousand in this whole ordeal. There were several alumni, uh, crush alumni members who were like, "How can we help cover this? We'll we'll help you guys back with the budget." And all that was redirected to the Crush Foundation, which is going to then just read it back to charity, not going towards the allegedly again. allegedly to charity. That's maybe happened. it's next year's ticket allotment. No, that's happened. That they raised the money for the tickets, and then there's also separate money or no the the budget I think accounts for the tickets, and then the money raised is going to charity. So. Allegedly goes to charity with, with the shady tactics. We don't know the shady. It allegedly goes to charity that are. It, free fun spirited we're going to walk into your stadium after we legally buy and pay the correct amount for these tickets and then reveal that we are the orange crush it's i mean who's to say it's not legal if you're using donated funds for poor and needy children and then you go and buy 200 tickets i mean that's the funds are not for the poor and needy children that's just the name that was attached to it and we have donated to the Boys and Girls Club, I'm sure. Whoever the money was supposed to go to, if it's not, and there's not a paper trail showing donations to, from the Orange Crush to these places and separate amounts that are going to tickets, there needs to be an investigation. The money, it's not like we're taking this money and we're just redistributing it back. It, there's there, The money's going to charity. It's a not-for-profit. That's, that's what you claim. That's what's happening. You can't just like... All you need is a couple good lawyers to fudge these numbers. That's all I'm saying. Additionally, moving on, um, I would say that if you're going to come up with something like we were discussing earlier, don't make it poor kids. Like, why can't you say it's like, I don't know, the Central Illinois Men's League or like, I don't know, something something that's non-controversial and that would have a valid reason to go to an Illini game. I'm with you there. That's that's what I think the big misstep is here is that they use the Boys and Girls Club and yeah, if they if they'd used a a not nearly as controversial name, this would not be nearly the issue it is. Which and it shouldn't my, even be an issue in the first place. My my final topic is um don't do not absolutely under no circumstances do not let this situation between Iowa and Illinois distract you from the fact that neither of them have made a Sweet 16 since 2005, and that is the real crime here. That is You want to talk about being hilarious. prestigious organizations, one. and neither of them have made a Sweet 16 since 2005. Good and one. Good one, Taylor. Thank you, thank you. And I will I conclude with before. the official statement from the pod. Okay, here we go. This is for immediate release. The official Big Hoops Pod statement on the Illinois-Iowa situation. Here at Big Hoops Pod, we believe in doing the right thing for the community. For this reason, we commend the actions of the Illinois basketball student section, known colloquially as the Orange Crush, in raising over $2,500 for local charities. 
However, we also believe in doing uh, things the right way. For this, we must condemn the shady and almost certainly illegal action that is impersonating a charity for reduced ticket prices. It is reprehensible to think that members of such a prestigious institution as the University of Illinois would stoop to such lows and pretend to be poor and needy children to, in <laughs> to infiltrate another team's stadium. Furthermore, we condemn the actions of the university. We commend the actions of the University of Iowa Athletic Department as they not only refunded the tickets purchased, but donated the 200 tickets to the Boys and Girls Club of Cedar Rapids so that actual needy children, many of whom certainly have never seen the Hawkeyes play in person nor in front of a sold out crowd, will now get the, the chance, will now have the opportunity of a lifetime. Actions have consequences, and the fraudulent, deceitful Orange Crush learned that the hard way. That, your vocabulary was off the charts there. That was incredible. That, was, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. That, uh, the one thing I will say is, like, regardless of if we were a Boys and Girls group Club or the Orange Crush, the ticket price we would have got would have just been the group rate. We didn't get the group rate because we were the Boys and Girls Club. That's another point I want to make. I want to make sure everyone knows that. I'll say it again. The Boys and Girls Club does not get a special rate. The group that goes gets a special rate. So. I'm glad you, I'm glad you cleared the air on, on, been, on saving a dime when, when the entire situation was. Was, was not a big deal. Oh, it got blown out of proportion. Okay, okay. And, and that's on us. That, I'll take blame for that. That one's on us. Uh, all right. All right. We moving on. Do you have anything else to, that you want to add, or do you think? No, I think I think we can. I think, I think the statement go. covers it. Yeah. I think it does. All right. Um, pretty pretty boring week as far as news. Uh, the news cycle in the Big Ten and um, the games were they were fine. There were a couple good ones. So we just decided for our, for our last piece of news that we're going to break down a couple of the top performances from the past week. Um, and the first of which being back to Illinois versus Wisconsin on Saturday. This is on Saturday, the 28th, yes. Uh, Matthew Meyer goes for a career high to, with 26, going 5 of 11 from three and, and grabbing six boards. He was great in that game. Yeah, he, that's, he couldn't miss. You can't complain about a stat line like that. I mean, I mean, I know that's like his MO is, is just shooting threes and making scoring points, but that's nothing to sniff at there. He, uh, he he was doing some some post game press conference not not at the podium but just you know some interviews out in, in front of the locker room and um, some of the guys are talking about it and his leadership style is a little different it's uh you know I'm hot get me the ball I want to run this play for me like he'll he'll just say that in the huddle and he gets the play and whenever he's shooting lights out like he did making you know he's isoing and he's pump fake sidestep you know step back threes you can't argue with the results and he on Tuesday against Nebraska he he came out hot again I think he made his first two um, but then he went cold I don't know what he finished but um he was kind of chucking there towards the end but as a team Illinois was kind of slow on offense there in, in spurts and so you know you live with what you get and sometimes you die with it as well the good thing is is that the Illinois team has enough scores elsewhere that can contribute if he's having an off day most of the time moving along yeah I would, I would agree with that yeah moving along the michigan uh penn state game jalen pickett goes for 25 8 and 8 taylor what'd you what'd you see out of, out of mr pickett luckily for my own sake i had a time conflict with this game and got to see exactly zero minutes of it oh, okay. because if if i had watched this game i I might not have a TV left. This game made me want to just hop on here immediately and just call, start calling for people's heads. I wanted, I wanted rotations changed, but after tonight, I think, I think things have changed, but I got to give it to pick it for that game. 25, eight and eight is a hell of a stat line. And uh, it's something he's capable of doing on any night. Any, every big 10 team's got to watch out for him. He's a, he's a stud. He's a, top 20 finalist for the wooden award he's he's going to be all big 10 first team um and yeah any night he he's a monster on the boards he is the he spearheads the offense 
Like you said, he had eight assists, and then whenever he's has a smaller defender, he backs him down to the paint. He's a he's a very talented player, and hopefully, he's steering this Penn State team towards a tournament berth because they're they're really fun to watch. Following that up, another Sunday game uh, between Michigan State and Purdue, where Zach Eady goes for a monster thirty eight and thirteen. Um, and really, that's just another day at the office for Zach Eady, which is absurd. But he is literally the the Yao Ming of college basketball, probably the most dominant player since Shaq at this point. I don't even I don't know if that's an overstate an overstatement. That's that's just the type of player that he is. He uh, it was a quiet thirty eight and thirteen. Honestly, they were feeding him and he's putting it up. It's not like the game wasn't particularly close. So it wasn't like these buckets were like huge, like there were no daggers. No but, memorable moments, but but 38 was, nonetheless. Yeah, they were down in the final six minutes or so, and this game was pushing 20, and people were calling for him to leave the game, and he, he really wanted that 40 ball. He didn't end up getting it. But he was playing down the stretch, which I'm not a huge fan of, but – He's a, he's a competitor. You got to No you wins are certain, that. especially on the road. I'd leave him in as long as you need. That's also true in, in this league. But, yeah, I mean, kid's a stud. He's going to win National Player of the Year, and it won't be close. It's, it's just what he does. Um, next game, uh, when was this one? Rutgers, this, that, uh, Rutgers, Rutgers, Iowa was – no, was it was on Sunday the 29th. Oh, okay. Wait, who did who played last night? Um, Iowa played Northwestern last night. That's Maryland right. played Indiana. Oh, sorry. Oh. Last night would have been Rutgers played Minnesota, beat them by thirty five. That yeah, that's the game. Yes, okay, so yeah, so game. Chris Murray goes for twenty four and six. Chris Murray, another guy that's a near lock for all Big Ten first team. He's another guy that's in the top twenty for the Wooden Award. Yeah, he's six. basically turned into his brother of last year. I mean, that's what Iowa does. Iowa just like crank out guys. Because two years ago, they were the two seed. They had Luca Garza, and he was the national player of the year. Absolute stud. They get bounced early. I don't remember who beat them, but they were a two seed, and I don't, I don't think they made the second weekend. Um, and then basically that – They didn't make the second weekend because they haven't made it since 2005. Is that so? At least. <laughs> I didn't do the research on that. Yeah. Illinois might have been the team at 2005. Illinois definitely in fact, they was, were. They were yeah, the team at 2005. They were definitely the team. So it's been longer before Iowa. Um, but, yeah, no, Chris or Keegan Murray came off the bench for that team that was a two seed. And then last year he steps into a starting role and he becomes one of the five best players in the country. Just like that, out of nowhere. He went from averaging probably seven or eight points coming off the bench to – this guy is elite, and now, and his brother played a, a role on that team. I don't. I, he started, I believe, but he played, you know, regular minutes, and he averaged probably seven or eight points. And now he's the guy that's an absolute monster. Uh, the only way you can separate the two of them is one's a righty and one's a lefty. Chris is the lefty, right? Yes. Yeah. He's he's very talented. I'm excited. To watch him play on Saturday, um, not at the game because our tickets got revoked. But, um, but yeah, he's he's a stud. <laughs> oh man, that just has to be one of the funniest things that I've ever heard of happening. It's a, yeah. it's an interesting. It, you don't get a lot of that in college basketball. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'll say, you know, back I don't I hate backtracking, but I'm gonna do it. Um, it's just like in the nature of, of the Big Ten and of like competitive spirit. I feel like this kind of stuff, like you, you're gritty, you're trying to – it's the Midwest and college kids. They're, I feel like this is something that if it happened 20 years ago, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But Yeah, I think social media, made it, social media made it a problem. Agreed. But moving on uh, into the Purdue versus Penn State game, um, I would just like to say Mason Gillis – Nuclear. Need, need I say more? Dude set the <clears throat> Mackey Arena record for threes made 
in a game and is only was only one back of the all-time Purdue record of threes made in a game. Broke Robbie Hummel's record and a couple other guys like Carson Edwards was on there and there was two other guys that were tied. But while oh, while Robbie was calling the game, oh, he was like he, he had to watch it with his own he, eyes. You could tell in his voice he was actively rooting for his record not to be broken, but he couldn't say that on the air. But oh, it was something special to watch, and I am obviously not a Purdue fan. I have not, but when you watch a record be broken, it's it's something special. And he lit it up. I was rooting for him to get to ten, tie the record, but never got there. This right here is what I think has I my mind has been changed about this Purdue team, and this team can win in March because Penn State came in with a great game plan, which is they whoever, stopped Edie. Whoever's guarding Mason Relatively. Hillis is going, because he's the worst shooter on the floor, he's going to come and double Zach Eady at every opportunity. And then Mason Gillis hits nine threes and goes for a 30 ball. That doesn't happen every game, though. I, I like the strategy. I think I think it should be tried again by other teams. It was just having to be Mason Gillis's night. Yeah, but it can be anyway. It can be Ethan Morton's night. It can be Fletcher Lawyer's night or Braden Smith. This team is deep enough. Everyone shoots it except for Zach. And he's good. He was good enough. He still probably went for 20 in this game, did he not? Uh, I can check that, but I don't have the. He, it's This team is different. This team, I mean, and it may just be Big Ten ball and the gap. No, Edie only had 18. Only had 18. What a, what a <laughs> horrible game for Zach Edie. Um, Brought his average down for sure. It did. Um, this, is, it, this team's just scary. That's just what happens. Um, whenever you play a team that's significantly better than everyone else in the conference, I imagine that this is how the West Coast Conference feels every year with with Gonzaga. I, I, could, I, I would say it's probably similar. All right. <laughs> Let's move along to our big spotlight, our Big Ten spotlight. This week's team of the week is the Maryland Terrapins. Um, Taylor, you uh, – You've been awfully high on Maryland lately. I, let's let's I am, get some of your thoughts on I it. am through the roof on Maryland right now. They are hot. And hot isn't even good to describe. I need a, I need a word for hotter than hot. Like if that Red word hot. existed in the English language, it would be it would perfectly describe the turtles right now. They are insane. They just beat a uh contending Big Ten team, Indiana at home ranked um, and they had a couple other games uh, of late that were close too. they had uh, oh shoot they I mean they they blew out Nebraska at home but I mean that's if you're not doing that there's really a problem uh, and then before that they beat Wisconsin by uh, 20 or 18 so I mean they're they're beating teams and they're beating them handily on at home and on the road it's Something that I I would watch for. I mean, I know they started out cold, so they're still down in the bottom of the rankings, but they're tied for fourth there with those other six teams at six and five and are on the up. I think they're getting double by. What do you think? They're the Big Ten's so hard to predict. I it's so hard to call like this team's good enough. Like there are so many teams that are good enough to get the double by. If I had to pick one of the six and five teams, they would be one of, at least in my top two. Um, yeah, they coming up on the schedule. They're going to uh, Minnesota on Saturday. They're going to East Lansing on Tuesday to play Sparty. And then on Saturday, they go back home to play Penn State, and that'll be a good one. And that, that Michigan State game should be good as well. A couple of real tests for this team. Um, and that, if at the end of that week they're 8-6 and six in the conference – I think that sets them up well. Now, what what's really changed for this team, because they've had these key pieces in place for a while now, um, but this year, Jameer Young transfers in from Charlotte, and he has been – he's flipped the switch on this, this Maryland team. He has been their best player. He's averaging 16 points a night. He's leading the team in scoring. He's He's pretty much doing it all, and then you've got – Dante Scott, Hakeem Hart, Julian Reese, um, that have been key contributors on this team in the past. And now with a with another leader um, coming in at the guard spot that 
has kind of flipped this team over, those guys are able to succeed even more and have bounced back from a, from a subpar year last year to this year being a clear tournament team, probably floating around the seven line. Yeah, they've got guys, and they know how to use them. Everybody knows their role. Everybody knows what they need to do. And they just go out and hoop. They just hoop every night, and it works. And it's it's a beauty to watch. It's it's good, clean basketball. Um, I mean, they only had five turnovers in the, when they played Indiana. That's right. I they mean, were super turnover, whatever the word I'm looking for is. They were great at, at holding on to the ball. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a thing of beauty to watch that game. And wasn't even close, beat them by 11. That was, I mean... You can't ask for more than that, especially in the Big Ten. You take everything you can and get it going. Yeah, and all all of these little things that can we can attribute that to Kevin Willard, and he's been he's been absolutely great uh, in the, in his first year with with the squad. And um, no, yeah, you can't ask for a better year from from your first year coach. I mean, there's nothing more you can ask except for go put us in contention for the conference and go make the tournament. Yeah, and you know, coming over from Seton Hall, he's done a great job. They're they're in a really good spot to succeed, and I, I look forward to see what they can do uh, coming into the, not just this year, but down the line. Um, all right, let's get into the tournament rankings. So, just a quick little PSA before we get into the tourney rankings. Um, my my metric has been broken, um, so I, I've adapted, and I have a new one. This I, I don't have the bracketology for it yet. I don't have seed lines. I don't have matchups, but I do have rankings, and we're going to discuss them pretty quickly here. So uh, keep it up uh, in the bottom three with with Minnesota at fourteen, Nebraska at thirteen, and Michigan at twelve. Also, the, these uh, these rankings don't take tonight, as in Thursday's games, into account. Um, so yeah, Michigan still a pretty pretty large gap between them and the rest of the, the field, but I could see that gap closing because our number 10 team is Ohio State, who with the new ranking system drops down two spots. We just talked about them, so I won't spend a ton of time. And then the team they just lost to is Wisconsin. They're at 10. I think they're also probably right outside the field, um, but they've moved up one spot due to Ohio State falling. And then ahead of them, we have Penn State, which is where we'll really get into it. Penn State jumps up a spot as well with the Ohio State fall, probably also floating just outside the tournament. They've kind of lingered there this the whole time we've been doing this podcast. They're 56 in the net, 56 strength the record, but uh, 48th in Ken Palm. So maybe a little bit better than what the resume says. What are your thoughts on, on the Nittany Lions? Briefly. Well, that 20 point shellacking last night is not going to help. Um, additionally, they sit at under 500 in the conference, which is good enough, or which is for uh, what is that, third, uh, 11th place, um, which not ideal, uh, but they're, they're also missing it. They don't have a true big guy. So any, any team they play with a big guy is just going to dominate them inside. Um, Jalen Pickett can only do so much by himself down there. And he's a big dude, but doesn't have it when they're playing, you know, Hunter, Sissoko, uh, Obviously, TJD, Edie. Edie. Yeah. I mean, guys like this. I mean, yeah, that's what they're going to run into. That being said, yeah, they're still like we talk about all these great teams at six and five. They're five and six. They're right there. That's how this. That's how the Big Ten is. We don't need to keep repeating it. That's they're right there. And like I said, I hope this team gets in because they're fun to watch. Coming at number eight, down two spots is Northwestern, and I assume they're going to keep falling because their their fall kind of stems from their loss against Iowa by 16 earlier in the week, and then their, the loss by 17 at home to Michigan today. I think it puts them right back close to, you know, are they going to make it or not? Yeah, I don't think I can add much there. I think their loss tonight, especially it being at home to a quad three team at the moment, uh bumps them down. Wisconsin might jump them there with their with their win tonight. And uh yeah, I think they need to turn it around pretty quickly or it could get ugly for in, in Evanston. All right. Uh number seven, we've got Michigan State. They stand pat at number seven. Um nothing really changed there. 28th strength of record. Again, the resume looks good. The metrics don't love them as much. 
Um, but this is a good team, well coached, have a lot of really solid pieces, and you know if if Walker, or Hogard, or Hauser, or Malik Hall, any of them, if they're having a great day, this is this is a team that that's tough to beat, and we've talked about that before. All right. Yeah, I um, think I think they are in a good place. Um, I feel like they should have a better record than they do. I feel like they've played down a couple games, but uh, they're still in a good place. They're tied at six and five with those other six teams, and I think they're I think they're looking good. Iowa uh, leapfrogs Michigan State to move from eight to six. Um, they had a win this weekend against Rutgers. Uh, at their place, and then the win against Northwestern uh, on Wednesday or Tuesday. Tuesday, because they played tonight. Um, so they moved back up to number six. They're the hardest team for me to predict in this league. Personally, I feel like they just jump around way too much on this list compared to these other teams. Yeah, I feel like they always have a, a movement next to their name there. And I think it's because – they live and die by the three, and that's not a consistent, you know, thing you can just do every night. Some days you're going to make them all, some days you're going to not going to make any, and some days you're going to make 50-50. Um, so who, depending on who they play and how many shots they make, they're going to jump wildly across this list. Yeah, and then rounding out this kind of, you know, eight, nine seed range of Big Ten teams with Michigan State, Iowa, and then Maryland, I would put them right in that that kind of tier three of the Big Ten. Um, 33rd net, 31 in Ken Palm and strength of record. Um, we talked about them a lot. This is a team that if I was a one seed and I saw them in the second round, I would I'd be scared. I would not be enjoying that that uh scouting report. I'd be thoroughly worried. Prep. Coming off yeah, one day to scout this team, that's that's not really what I'd look forward to. All right. Um Rutgers was two last week. Now they are four with the new metric. Their loss against Iowa is what did them in um, and brought them down to four. They're probably looking at a seven seed-ish. Um, 14th in Ken Palm, but 37th best resume. Uh, so, yeah, this uh, this team guards. This team has guys that can score. Uh, you know, they have enough pieces. We've talked about this team. and like, We've talked about all these teams enough at this point to know what you're getting yourself into whenever you play them. And none of these teams are teams that I'd be particularly fond of seeing in the tournament. Yeah. I, I mean, Rutgers is another team that goes out and beats people who you would think just looking at the roster and the, the guys that are on it wouldn't do it. But then again, here they are beating, beating Purdue, the only team to do that all year. So they're the best team at matching up with Purdue in this conference. And I don't think it's particularly close. I think what for whatever reason, Rutgers has Purdue's number. Um, and someone is going to have to try and replicate that game plan in March for them to be successful and knock them off. I think they, they've laid out the blueprint fairly, fairly successfully. You have to have the pieces to make it happen. But if you do, I they, we've proven they're beatable. But Obviously, they're great. Um, Indiana is three. They were three last week. Um, the loss to Maryland is kind of what kept them from from, uh, from jumping up to two with, with the Rutgers fall. Um, but they got a good win against Michigan State. This team is definitely back. Um, 23rd in the net, 21st in Ken Palm, 29th in strength of record probably looking at roughly a six seed. Um, Going to Maryland. Well, Maryland, first off, is a good matchup for Indiana. They've got guys who match up very, very well. And then going to Maryland when they're hot, um, and it's a Wednesday night when you have class in the morning and when you get back and you just – I don't know. I don't, I don't take that game as a um, – end-all, be-all for the Indiana season, but it was definitely an eye-opener because I thought it would be closer than what it was. Yeah, and again, nature of the conference, anyone can beat anyone on any given night. That's, yeah, I mean, those games happen again. It's not like they've lost anything from losing that game. It's just they could have jumped if they had. 
Uh, but the team that did take advantage uh, was Illinois, who moves up to number two now. Still probably looking at a six seed. Um, but they get the win at Wisconsin, which is which is a big win. And then hold on against Nebraska on a game where, where not everyone you know, had a spectacular night. But defensively, they were really good. Uh, again, they play Iowa this weekend in Iowa City. That's going to be a test for this team to prove that they're the second best team in the conference. Are you going to that game? No, our tickets were pulled. <laughs> oh man, I, yeah. that's oh man. All right, all right, and then so, obviously number one is Purdue. Yes, that I mean nothing, nothing more to say there. I think we've we've hashed that out. They still look solid, and they just put a beat down on uh, Penn State as we talked about earlier. So. Doesn't yeah, look like again, much is going to change there. Yeah. So, again, I apologize for not having the bracket. I'll hopefully get that figured out by next week. We'll have we'll have matchups. We'll have a little bit more discussion. We'll have seed lines, um, and we can talk about those. Uh, but I, I think this new metric's a little bit better, personally. I like, I like the way that it ranks these teams a little bit better. I feel like the metrics were weighted a little bit too heavily in the old one where teams like Ohio State were, you know, still pushing the bubble. And now I feel like what you've done is is more important. So so teams like Michigan State will rise from that. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, like I said, I'll, I'll get a bracket out for episode number four. All right, let's move on to uh, our, our predictions for the games this weekend. No games on Friday. So I think we'll probably shoot to post this video seven, six o'clock ish. Um, so the games that will be being played tomorrow, whenever you're seeing this, first off uh, at 11 a.m. Central on Fox, we have Michigan State traveling to the rack. Um, it's a rematch of a game that was played two weeks ago ish on, on January 19th, where Michigan State got a 13 point win at home in that game Rutgers shot I believe two of 17 from three um, and Michigan State shot over 50 percent and that was kind of what what did them in um, that was the Jackson Kohler game he came off the bench and gave them 12 and 11 for the Spartans um, and no one scored over 12 for Rutgers Taylor what are you looking for in this rematch yeah I'm looking for uh Rutgers to shoot better um they shot under 12% from three, which is uncharacteristic for them. And I think they match up relatively well to Michigan State. It being at the rack, um, a noon tip in Piscataway um, on a Saturday, I think I like Rutgers to win the game. I do too. I think – I know that we saw – I mean, Iowa got the sweep over them, but I think, like I said, the rack is a is a magical place and it's nearly impossible to get a win in there. I could see Rutgers moving up to eight and four in conference and, and trying to, to break away from Illinois um, by getting a win on Saturday. And I'm not sure what the line will be, probably three ish. We hate I was gonna points. say four, yeah. We hate the three point line. The not, three we, point we, line. We love the three point line. We hate the three point spread. Um it is the hardest one to 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 decide. Once again, we I, went two for opinion. two again today. We How did. We did. We're, we're four it, for it, the it, last four, so take our advice. It has been tweeted. Yeah. So, so which shameless us. plug? Follow Twitter. This is your at chance. B1G you you B1G can be the Watch first Dog one to news. like the. Yes. At B One G Watch. You can Dog be the first one to get all of our picks and make bucos of money, not financial advice, um, to by using our picks as we are perfect back to back days. Next game. We've talked enough about the Illinois Iowa game. Um, it's being played at 1:30 Central in Iowa City on Fox. Taylor, what do you look what do you want to see on the court in this game? Um, I like the fact that it will be a, a overly biased crowd now at in in Iowa City there. And uh, and I don't think Illinois is gonna go in and shoot the lights out against the team that shoots the lights out if they get into a pissing match. I like Iowa, um, and I don't think Iowa's going to play a below-average game, so I'll take it close, probably two, three, four points, but I like I like the Hawkeyes. 
joke all you will about Illinois being rivals with everyone while not being rivals with anyone. Illinois. That's not and a Iowa, joke. That is that is legit, by the way. That is Illinois seriously. and Iowa is a rivalry. The over the past four years, even like I know it, and it was in the past since you know I've become aware of of Illinois basketball. This has been the most important team on the schedule, regardless of who's yeah. good. The the Kofi and Garza games where Io was was great. Demonte Williams almost got into a fight with Connor McCaffrey. Um, which is Connor McCaffrey back on the team now? Yeah, he's still there. Or no, that's Patrick. Patrick is. Oh, back Patrick as well. is, is. He's back yeah. now. They're, yeah, they're both. They're both playing. So. So yeah, this game is going to be close. It's if I had to guess, I think it's going to be low scoring, which I think favors Illinois. Um, it's just going to be scrappy. Both of these teams really, really need to win this game. Um, and don't don't doubt Brad. You can, I mean, it hasn't looked overly pretty recently, but we've won six of our last seven. Um, he just wins. So I would take Illinois outright if I had to bet, potentially biased. Um, it's going to be a good game regardless. All right, uh, Purdue, this is the game of the week, however. In fact, we've talked oodles about Illinois and Iowa. Purdue is going to Assembly Hall at 3 Central on ESPN. This is going to be electric. Yeah, I think um, Indiana's got to be ready. They know what's coming. They've got an entire year of film. It's their biggest game of the year at Assembly Hall. It's their number one rival. It's Purdue coming to town. They've only got one loss, the number one team. Uh, Indiana has all the reason to win or to go out and, and do their best. Um, but I don't see Trace stopping Zach Eady whatsoever. Um, and I, I think Purdue wins it probably six to eight. Not a blowout, but it's not a one-possession game. I think it's going to be a blowout. I, I think, think so. Purdue, I think Purdue is going to demolish Indiana. We'll have to I see think, what the line is. but uh, I think – that Zach Eady is going to get TJD into foul trouble. I think that's going to be their point of attack. I think, yeah, I think Trey's going to pick up two fouls very quickly. Purdue's going to take a 12 to 14 point lead in the half in Assembly Hall. It's going to be really quiet. And then Eady's just going to put on a show in the second half. I think, I think Fletcher Lawyer maybe, you know, gives him 15 as well. I think he steps up, you know, game in his home state. Right, he's an Indiana guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Isn't as far I think as I'm aware too. I think they're both Indiana guys. I might be wrong. I apologize if I am. Um, I think I think flip this Purdue by twenty plus. That's my that's my that point. is a hot take, but that's that's where I'm going with this, and we'll see. You know, well, I'll, I'll, this is a TikTok video, is what this is, and if I'm wrong, it will be a different kind of TikTok video. <laughs> um, all right, and then the nightcap on Saturday, Maryland goes into the barn in Minneapolis. Minnesota's one and ten in conference. Maryland's looking to get moved to seven and five with a win. After everything I've said uh, for Maryland tonight, I'm not. I'm going to keep it very brief here. Maryland wins this game by fifteen plus. That's in, all in the barn. Yeah, I mean it's you have. To, I don't know what the spread's going to be. Just trying to predict, but going on the road, if it's going to be double digits on the road, and I'm still taking Maryland. We'll see. Hopefully, hopefully this Minnesota team starts to play some some competitive ball, but they did not on Wednesday night. All right, uh, let's move to the Sunday games. Um, game of the week. If this was a football game, it's the game. If it was a Saturday in November. And it's a, it's a Sunday in February, and the three and eight struggling Buckeyes are going to to come to Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan six and five, looking to move to seven and five. Um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, talking? I will be in attendance for this game. Uh, it's a one p.m. tip here locally, and um, I think trying to pull as much of the bias as I can out of it, Michigan. If they can play 85% of what they played tonight against Northwestern 
and Ohio State continues to play as they have for the past, well, since conference play started. Um, I think it'll be an eight-pointer, um, which, which is a comfortable win for Michigan. Um, nothing to shake a stick at, but it's not – it could be better. They could have more convincing wins, especially for a team that's on the down and out like Ohio State is. But I like Michigan for this game. I like Ohio State to cover, and I'm sure Michigan will be a favorite. I think they'll they'll probably win it outright, but I could see, like I said, regression. You guys tend to, you know, you're building a a mountain range with your with your levels of play so far over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I can't and argue there. I think you've probably just hit your highest peak thus far, and so we who's could, to say it can't go higher though? We it could, but there's also a really good chance that this <laughs> could be a. It's not going to be a valley game, going. though. It could be. Oh man, uh, it could be. I just and if it is, I still don't hate your chances. You know, you could you could win this game fifty four to fifty one if you really needed to. Hunter Dickinson is the best player on the court. Um, yeah, this is this. I I'll watch this game. Um, and it'll be it'll be good. Well. We'll see how how that one goes. I'll be in attendance and can report back. Yeah, let's. You should you should give us a little vlog. That's what we should <laughs> like after Illinois Michigan game specifically. Like something that we have a true opinion on. You know, we're walking back from the stadium. Give us a little vlog, thirty second video on Twitter. That I think I can fun. do that. That's doable. Yeah. That's doable. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah, and then yeah, we can post. We'll see what the TikTok reception is as well. Is. Yeah. All right. Um, three thirty Central Time. On Big Ten Network, Penn State travels to Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, Penn, this game was played on the 21st of January, so that was fairly recently as well. Penn State won that game by 11, and they Nebraska had a, had a poor performance at the line. Um, Andrew Funk hit five threes and with, for 23. Um, Lundy went for 16, and Jalen Pickett had a 12 and 13 double double. Um, does Nebraska still have some guys out Couple. or they got, they've got the guys back. Okay. Um, so with that being said, I think unless Tommy Naga goes shot for shot with Funk or Lundy, which everyone decides to have their game that day, uh, I think Penn state is a relatively safe call for this game. I like Penn state as well. Um, we're going to see a shootout would be the, like, I predicted low scoring game for Illinois, Iowa, Ohio State, Michigan. This one might touch the 90s. I you have think. that much faith in, I, in Nebraska's ability to score the basketball? No. But <laughs> you mean you mean 90 combined, right? Like 50 to no, 40? No. I think that we're going to see there's a chance here, and I, again, could be way off base with this prediction, that these teams are just going to be you know shooting lights out each because – Nebraska, they've kind of reformed their offense with their injuries um, to Juwan Gary. Um, and they shoot it. And Tommy Naga, you know, he doesn't need much space to get a shot off. Neither does Andrew Funk. Um, Penn State's going to win this game. Um, and I'll, I'll probably take him to cover too, but I think it's going to be high scoring. All right. And the capper on this weekend in the Big Ten is Northwestern traveling to Wisconsin for a game that was played 10 days ago or whatever. Um, 5.30 p.m. Central on Big Ten Network. Um, Northwestern at Wisconsin. Northwestern won at home against Wisconsin, 66-63. Another game where Wisconsin would have won had they shot the ball better from the line. Boo Booey went for 20. Adige went for 16 in that game. And then for Wisconsin, the score was Jordan Davis who went for 15. But tonight against Ohio State, he only played six minutes. So, you know, tough to know what to expect out of Wisconsin. Well, yeah, but I would say it's tough to know what you're going to expect out of Northwestern. I mean, Adige is, is a, the pen, linchpin of the It's game. legitimately a coin flip for Northwestern. Well, while we're on the talk of Adige, uh, can we give a shout-out to him for reaching his 1,000th point at Northwestern? That's, oh, good for him. That's a, that's a, big, that's a big accomplishment. Um, back to the game, though, uh, I think it's – Oh man, I hate picking games that you you don't know what performance you're going to get out of out of guys because they're so up and down all the time. Like the entire Big Ten. Yes, and that's why this 
gives me oh man, just makes my brain like overheat trying to think of these games. But Wisconsin, it was a three point game the last time at Northwestern. Wisconsin, I mean, it was only ten days ago. Wisconsin or Northwestern was coming off of their break. I think this was their first game back from their COVID pause. But um, so they were, they hadn't practiced with each other in a couple days. Um, but I think I think this is a Wisconsin win, maybe by the same score as it was for Northwestern last time, maybe a point or two more. It'll be close, um, unless Adige just decides to go over thirty. That it won't be, but if he's, I mean, even if he's five for twelve, I think it's it's a two possession game. But I give it to Wisconsin. I like Wisconsin too. I like them to move to six and six, and Northwestern would fall to six and six. Um, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how how the bubble plays out here because if Wisconsin gets this win, obviously it's a home game, but you're saying they're probably going to pass Northwestern. Penn State's right there. Um, Ohio State and Michigan are, are a couple steps away, but then you have teams like, you know, Michigan State and, and Iowa and Maryland that are, you know, in the last four buys territory that, you know, if they go on a skid, they might not make it. Um, and each game means so much while simultaneously really not meaning a ton in my conference play just because everyone's so tight right there, you know, I guess, you know, you could move from third to, to ninth in one game. So just the nature of the conference, it we picked a really fun year to to jump in and, and start talking. Every about year is fun in the Big depth. Ten. Every is, year is fun in the Big but Ten. But this year is fun while simultaneously not being This year is fun good. for a different reason because everybody stinks. And so it's going to be a close game every night. Everybody's average. Everybody's average. It's it's a fun conference, and they're going to. It's get all eight semantics. Nine teams in. It's all semantics, Graham. Absolutely. Um. Yeah. So that that'll conclude uh, our our hoops talk for today. You got your. You have any final thoughts, Taylor? Yeah, I've just got one thought. Uh, with six teams tied for fourth at six and five, and two teams right behind them at five and six, if you are not excited for the next month of of basketball which is the big 10 in february and the tournament in march then you might need to like get some sort of evaluation this is going to be a tough uh, exciting stretch of 30 days of basketball before the big 10 tournament starts and it is going to be one of the most enjoyable times of the year has to be in my opinion yeah today's groundhog day as we're recording this hugs to phil saw his shadow six more weeks of winter but luckily for us, it doesn't matter because it's six more weeks of regular season Big Ten basketball. And that's that's what is what's the most important. Nice weather is overrated when you can stay inside and watch Penn State play Nebraska on a on a Saturday afternoon. Anytime, Sunday, anytime Saturday. Big Ten basketball is on, it could be doing whatever outside and it will not bother me one bit. Absolutely. So yeah, that that's it. Um Make sure you, like I said, sub- like and subscribe this video. Um, we made a silent post. We referenced the, the first episode a lot whenever we posted the second episode, um, but you guys would, weren't able to see it. It is up now if you guys are wanting to watch it. Um, it's in the playlist. It's public. Anyone can watch it. it. It's two weeks old now, so be advised there, but that is has been uploaded and we'll add this one to the playlist as well subsequently you know give us a follow on twitter on tiktok both of those links are in the description i said it earlier i'll say it again Uh, please 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 help some brothers out it would be appreciated absolutely all right well um i guess that's it let's sign off all righty we'll see you guys next week yep thank you